There have been so many officer-involved shootings the last few years, nationally, right here at home. Sometimes the officer is shot, sometimes the officer is the victim, sometimes the officer is the accused. Oftentimes as well, there are big periods of unrest after that. And every time I watch this on the news, I think to myself, who in the world would want to be a big city cop these days? Do you worry that a lot of good people who might have wanted the job no longer will? Um, yes, I do worry. And it's very frustrating. You know, I've been in this business for 45 years. I have been here in an arc of change of policing that's unprecedented. And it doesn't seem to matter that in terms of historical terms, the police are more restrained in the use of force than they ever have been before, or more diverse in their makeup, or more selective, or more highly trained, or more committed to community-based policing. Sadly, there's a national narrative right now into which every police critical incident is slotted. I mean, police shootings are down over the course of history, but data can't beat stories. And unfortunately, Stories often drive policy and they drive the statements of public people. Now, there's nothing more important to the health of a diverse democratic society than rule enforcement and order maintenance and creating an environment in which a free society can occur. Because where there are many laws guaranteeing freedom, there's a temptation to take advantage of that freedom. And in order to get neighborhoods and communities to live safely together, we need a credible law enforcement presence. And I feel sadly that in many ways that's being undermined. And it's hurtful that particularly where we need quality recruiting the most, which is in the minority community, the only time all too often these young people hear from their leaders is to vilify and criticize the police. We need the best and brightest of every segment of American society. This is essential work. It is service work. It is overall a social service that's basically filling the gaps for a society that's walked away from its social safety net for the last 35 years. So it's a challenging job. It's an essential job. It's a job that can give a life meaning. But unfortunately, in the last couple of years, we've created a toxic environment for the recruiting of police officers, and I do worry about it. If you went home tonight and you had an 18-year-old son or daughter, mm -hmm. and they said, Dad, I'm graduating from high school in a few months. I think I want to be a big city cop maybe Milwaukee or St. Louis or Boston or L.A. or New York, Chicago, would you say, yes, good career choice, or think about it? Well, no matter what you think of institutions, whether you think they're good the way you are and you want to join them, whether you think they could be improved and your participation would make them better, institutions change because of the quality people they have. And we need idealistic people devoted to a life of service. Those are the children I happen to raise. I mean, my two children are in the most vilified professions in America right now. My daughter is a high school English teacher, so all the ills of education are, of course, her fault. And my son is a police officer in Washington, D.C., so all of the ills of society are his fault. Now, in point of fact, both narratives are false. All right, we need high-quality teachers and high-quality police officers to do the essential work of creating a solid America that's both safe and educated. And we need to stop making the narrative about the failure of two institutions to fix all of America's social problems. All right, it's cheap grace to criticize the police and walk away from the problems of intergenerational poverty. And the fact of the matter is the police weren't configured originally to be the social service of agents first resort for the poor, but they are. The criminal justice system was not configured to be the system that was responsible for the negative outcomes of, of long-term poverty and unemployment. But it is. And so if our current troubles finally get and wake America out of its lethargy about the urban poor, maybe we'll make some progress. The challenge is I'm hopeful that the next generation of people who are idealistic enough to march in solidarity demonstrating against injustice are dedicated enough and sophisticated enough to know that if they want to change the system, they've got to be a part of the system. It's easy to make a criticism and walk away. It's a lot harder to get into that institution, as my generation did, and work your way up the chain of command, experience the reality of the work, recognize the difficult challenges we face, and do something about it. So you would tell your son or daughter, go for it, or not right now? I'd say absolutely go for it. Pick a quality agency, but yes, certainly do it. By and large, media coverage of police action in the United States today 
are, is it unbiased or is it uh, sensationalistic and unsupportive? I think what happens, unfortunately, in the change in the media from when I was a younger man to the change in the media now, is that speed is the enemy of truth. And what's happened is that our, our traditional media are under such commercial pressure that they are really committed to getting something out immediately and then repent at leisure, but they got it first. I mean, one of the great frustrations about the Ferguson, uh, Missouri uh, uh, disturbances and the investigation was we found out months later there was no hands up, don't shoot. Nobody ever did that. Nobody ever said that. But it was reported as truth and informed much of the public reaction. We would find out through the DNA evidence that the officer was in fact assaulted, that the suspect had tried to take his gun away from him. But criminal justice investigations are painstaking and long term. You know, exciting you know, headlines based on the latest rumor grab the attention of the public. And so, yeah, it is difficult for us. Am I going to say it's biased? No. I'm going to say it's been adversely affected by the immediacy of social media and by the commercial pressures upon it. And I'm afraid the standards of our news media have dropped accordingly in response to those pressures. I mean, a lot of newspapers, you know, pride themselves on having a fact-checking column. Well, I remember when all columns had their facts checked. Reporters didn't print anything until they vetted their sources. They didn't print a fact as fact until they'd gotten confirmation from more than one place. Nobody's got the time to do that right now. So intellectually, I understand it. But as the subject of it, and as my profession is the subject of it, and its coverage affects its legitimacy in the community, I'm very concerned that the social media pressure and the pressure for immediacy over accuracy is undermining our ability to uh, serve the public. Generally speaking, politicians today, supportive of law enforcement or pandering to the public? Um, I don't want to you know, categorize it quite that way, that the alternatives are only support law enforcement or pander to the public. I mean, law enforcement needs principled critics. All right, we don't get everything right. We're not perfect. The tension in policing is always going to be how do we insulate policing from partisan politics but still have accountable policing to, uh, to its faults and shortcomings? And that's been a stress in American history for over 100 years. You know, there have been very many varieties of governing policing because we've learned to our rue more than once that political control of policing all too often leads to corruption and bad policing. I mean, a case can be made that in Chicago in 1968 and at the Pettus Bridge in Selma in 1963, the police were doing the bidding of their political masters. But it wasn't good policing. It wasn't quality policing. It wasn't constitutional policing. But it was politically supported. So we don't want to go too far down that lane. But we do have to be accountable. So I would say, you know, the tension is between when political figures take the time to try to learn what's going on before they start issuing press releases and saying things that inflame public opinion. I get they're human beings. I get they have constituencies. And unfortunately, modern politics is all about your base, so to speak, rather than what's the right thing. And different bases have different messages they expect to hear. You know, policing is, you know, not always right, but it is certainly not always wrong. It's credible. It's important. It's certainly as important to America's safety as the military is. And so supporting it means supporting the best of policing while still retaining your, you know, uh, your right to criticize bad policing. And that's what I need from politicians. Whatever party they are or color they are, I need them to draw attention to the good, even as they retain their right to criticize. So it's not about you always have to be on my side or how dare you criticize us, but, but balance. I want balance for my politicians. Last question. Nobody knows what tomorrow will bring. But if I ask you to look into the crystal ball, do you see the public safety situation in urban America in the not too distant future getting worse before it gets better? And what needs to happen for things to get better? I think it's under pressure right now. And I think the pressure comes from a lot of different directions. I think law enforcement in many ways has become the fall guy for unattended social ills since the 80s. All right, it became fashionable in America to blame the problems of the urban poor on the urban poor. Crime. In the, among the urban poor is one of the many social pathologies that affects it. 
I mean, here in Milwaukee, like every major city in America, the most crime victimized community is the African American community. They represent close to 80% of my homicide victims every year, close to 90% of my aggravated assault victims every year, 60% of my robbery victims every year are African American, and their assailants look like them. Why? Because although every social class wants to get high or sin at the same rate, public space violence belongs to the poor. That's where the police are summoned, and that's where the overwhelming victims of crime, African American victims of crime, want the police trying to make them safe. At the same time, we've inherited social problems and historical problems, not of our making, but this generation of policing has to deal with it. There is an inherent tension. My worry is that the conversation would advance beyond policing. And if that happens, we will have missed an opportunity to take a step back and say, wait a minute, this society has responsibilities. And some of its responsibilities are too, as the Bible would say, the least among us. And we can't walk away, you know, I can draw a tight circle around the highest crime areas of this city and incorporate the highest levels of unemployment, the highest levels of poverty, the most abandoned and foreclosed houses, and the most high school dropouts. That shouldn't surprise anybody. But no other institution is attacked for intervening in those neighborhoods. Education isn't attacked. Welfare isn't attacked. The fire department isn't attacked. The housing inspectors aren't attacked. We are drawn to the same network of problems every other social agency is. We just have responsibility for a different slice of the pathology. It's time for America to rediscover urban poverty and its long-term pernicious impact on the lives of a big section of America that only wants to seek the same opportunities every other American has. Now, if we can wake some of our politicians up to stop the bickering and pay attention to problem solving, then our recent troubles will have done some good. But if we end up circling the wagons and appealing to our bases and making it all about who's got access to guns, we get nowhere. And that's a real problem for us. Nationally, I'm not real optimistic because over the eternal gridlock in Washington, I'd certainly hope at the state level we could get beyond this rural-urban divide. But even here in Wisconsin, I'm not optimistic about the likelihood of uh, our state legislature recognizing that the problems of Milwaukee are the state's problems. If money wasn't a problem, would Milwaukee be a safer city with twice as many cops on the street? What twice as many peeps, cops on the street do in the best of circumstances, and this is what New York is able to do because they've got so many, they can move them around, is create the environment in which informal social control can take place. It's not about having twice as many police officers to make twice as many arrests. Criminal justice system's overwhelmed now. Criminal justice system can't handle what we bring to them now. The challenge for us and what we try to do here in Milwaukee, you know, in addition to our you know, data-driven anti-crime work, is to put the foot and bicycle patrols out there to make people feel safe because the whole notion of fear is that it drives people out of their public spaces and public spaces devoid of informal social control attract criminals because the only other people in there are prey. And so we're trying to help the community take control of its public spaces. That's the essential thing. More police officers, sure, they make that easier. But I recognize where I work. I recognize that, you know, to the state and federal government right now, Milwaukee's problems somehow are divorced from America's and Wisconsin's problems. They're its problems. So it's up to Milwaukee to spend the money on policing. And it, is, it spends by far the largest part of the city budget is spent on law enforcement and policing. And so our job is to do the absolute best we can with what we have. You know, overall crime is still 26% lower than it was in 2007. All right, we had a terrible year in homicides last year. 44 of the 60 biggest cities in America had increases in homicide last year. The fallout from the coverage of policing is having an impact on the levels of violence in the central city. It is emboldening people that are preying on the city right now, and it is creating a more difficult circumstance for us to uh, do our policing. So more would be helpful, I think, more from the aspect of creating an environment where people feel comfortable using their streets and recreating. And that's, you know, that's something we do the best we can with what we have.